what is protein? And this is uh, kind of a nebulous topic because we know that we need protein, but it's never really described as far as what this uh, all important macronutrient is. Thank you all for coming in to this lecture, Protein for Muscle Optimization. We're gonna talk about why we're specifically focusing on muscle optimization and why we're talking to this specific group, you all being hopefully CrossFit athletes. So my name is Nicholas Hedges, and like I was saying earlier, uh, I'm a chiropractor. I also work a ton with athletes, working a lot of, on a lot of their physical ailments, but a big portion of that and a big portion of preventing the physical ailments that come about as a result of uh, training at a high level is the nutritional component. And, and really, this is something that I didn't know a whole lot about when I was a college athlete getting injured all the time. And I really wish that I had a lot of this information that I'm going to be bringing to you guys. So I'm a chiropractor. I'm also a certified chiropractic sports physician. I've also got a master's degree in sports science and rehabilitation. And I've been teaching uh, at the wonderful Colorado Mountain College Anatomy and Physiology for the last three years. So who is this lecture specifically for? Uh, I really wanted to cater this lecture to the people that come to CrossFit Low Oxygen. So specifically, this is for individuals between the ages of 20 and 60 who exercise quite regularly between, you know, uh, two and seven days per week. Now, the individuals at the fringes, as far as age, can still benefit from this lecture, uh, but there are certain special populations that there is more information necessary to really give them good guidelines as far as their protein consumption. So the reason that I say this is because I don't want you guys leaving the lecture today saying, oh, Dr. Nick said that my 10 year old child who weighs 15 pounds needs to get 30 grams of protein in for breakfast. Uh, that would be a failure on my part as far as inputting who this lecture is for and some of the specific material that needs to be addressed for uh, young athletes. And then at the other end of the spectrum, we've got you know, older athletes. So these are athletes in the, between 60 and like 70, 80, 90 years old. And they'll still benefit from this, but they also experience a little bit more anabolic resistance. They have a, their bodies actually resist putting on muscle protein and getting gains, if you will, more than people inside of the age range that we're talking about. People that are really, really trying to lose weight, this information is really helpful for them. However, there are more specific dietary interventions that can also assist them if their primary goal is to lose weight. So I feel like uh, by and large, the primary goals of all the individuals here are fitness and muscle optimization so they can have high performance and feel really, really good. So our agenda, we're gonna talk about why a protein focus is going to be important. Uh, we're gonna be talking about what protein is, and then we're gonna be giving recommendations as far as the range is for how much protein should I be intaking on a daily basis? And then, also very important, how should that protein be distributed throughout my day in order to maximize my gains, my, my muscle protein synthesis, which is gonna be a theme throughout this, is maximizing muscle protein synthesis uh, with my protein intake. And then we're also gonna talk about protein sources and talk about some of the supplements that we may or may not uh, need or which supplements may or may not be beneficial. So why a protein focus? So protein is uh, really important for muscular gains. And the, the reason that we're talking about this through the lens of protein is because everyone needs protein, right? But different amounts of protein can have different effects on our bodies. So even if we're in a fasted state and we're not eating uh, tons and tons of food or calories in general, our bodies will still synthesize really, really important organ structures. Our heart isn't gonna shrivel up because we didn't eat for a day, and our lungs and our liver and internal organs aren't gonna get smaller because our body prioritizes the synthesis of these organs over 
muscle protein. So muscle protein, especially after we hit about the age of 20 to 25, once we reach skeletal maturity, it, the muscle protein synthesis rates depend much more on the protein intake that we get through our meals as opposed to be, being hormonally driven. That's why college kids can eat ramen noodles and Lucky Charms and maybe have a protein shake at the end of the day. And then they're still going to get massive gains in the gym and they're still going to grow two inches every summer. So once we reach skeletal maturity, though, things start to decline hormonally. So we have to do our due diligence as far as intaking protein and intaking it in the right way to ensure that we're maximizing our rates of muscle protein synthesis. And if we do a good job of that, actually studies have shown that we can have the same rate of muscle protein synthesis as someone who's between the ages of 16 and 20. So that does depend on a couple of different factors, uh, including the amount of exercise that we're doing. But like we said earlier, most of the people in here are exercising, you know, somewhere between, you know, three, four and seven days a week if you're Tennille and Jared, which, yeah, I tell them not to do that and they keep doing that. But, you know, neither here nor there. <laughs> Another reason we're having a protein or a muscle focus is because when we're looking at longevity and we're looking at the lifespan and the health span, if you will, so not only how long we live, but how long we're really functional, how long we're able to ski, mountain bike, hike, etc. That's more like the health span. The big markers that correlate with that longer health span and lifespan are actually markers of muscle function. So hand grip strength with a dynamometer is actually a good indicator of how long you're going to live. Uh, your ability to squat and the amount of weight that you're able to squat, uh, the amount of lean muscle mass that you have is also critically important for your health span, especially as we age, as we get into the later decades of life, our 70s and 80s and 90s when our bone mineral density and our uh, muscle growth naturally starts to, de to decline, we want to set up a really good base as we're approaching our 30s, 40s, 50s, so that then as we reach that natural decline, we're much better off. Because the things that actually you know, lead to morbidity and mortality in individuals in those age ranges are not always things like cancer and heart disease. They might be you know, sedentarism, not by choice, but because they fell and broke their hip or they broke their radius because they slipped on ice, things like that. And when we're sedentary, sometimes not by choice, then we have very rapid declines in our muscle growth. So we want to really prevent falls as we're older. And we also want to prevent things like fractures and things like that, that are really big causes of mortality in older individuals. So <clears throat> the big thing to start here is what is protein? And this is uh, kind of a nebulous topic because we know that we need protein, but it's never really described as far as what this uh, all important macronutrient is. Let's see if I can change this thing up a little bit. But protein in actuality is just an umbrella term for these long chains of building blocks called amino acids. So we've all heard about protein, and some of us have probably heard about these amino acids, but the amino acids are actually very, very important when we're talking about protein. And I don't really think that this topic gets stressed enough when we're talking about protein because different amino acids have different functions within our bodies. And what's the first thing that our body does when we take in protein is it breaks down these very large molecules into their individual constituent amino acids. So think of them more like a long, like friendship bracelet, like what's on here. And then after they've been broken down, our body says, oh, hey, I need this over here. I need these organelles to be made. I need hopefully muscle protein synthesis to occur as a result of this really hard workout that I did. And then our body will assimilate the proteins necessary to create whatever structures we need. So amino acids are the things that create protein molecules. Our protein molecules that we intake are broken down before they're assimilated into the things that we need for our bodies. So the, one of the things I'd like for everybody to take out of today is that we're not really intaking protein. 
we're intaking actually amino acids. And some of these amino acids are really vital for certain portions of physiology that we'd really like to focus on, like muscle growth. So this isn't an organic chemistry class, nor is it a biochemistry course. Uh, so this is what those amino acids look like. They're really small structures. And uh, proteins themselves can be composed of 20 to 30 of these linked together by peptide bonds, or it can be composed of hundreds of these linked together and bonded and spiraled in all these different forms and shapes. Now, one important thing to note about these, these amino acids is that we've got about 20 of them in our bodies, and some of these are essential amino acids. What do we mean by essential amino acids? It means that it is essential for us to get these into our diet. So we can't synthesize these on our own in our body. We have to intake all of these amino acids in order to create all the proteins necessary for normal physiology. These non-essential amino acids, we're pretty good at making ourselves. And then condi conditionally essential amino acids are ones that we can synthesize, but they're dependent on the presence of these more essential amino acids. So about nine essential amino acids are essential to get into our diet. And some of these are going to be really important for various functions. One of the really big ones that we actually need to focus on if we're talking about muscle protein synthesis, the uh, recovery and reformulation of muscle tissue, is actually this guy right here, leucine. So what they found is that leucine, this specific amino acid, you'll notice here, well, I'm just going to talk about one thing on the structure here. This would be called a branched chain. So has anybody ever heard about BCAAs, standing for branch chain amino acids? You're getting leucine in with that. That's one of the important branch chain amino acids that we use for physiological functioning. And the reason it's important is because this is a signaling molecule for muscle protein synthesis. So who's ever heard that vegetarians can't gain as much muscle mass as omnivores or carnivore people? Has anybody ever heard someone say that? You heard it all the time, right? Does anybody know why that could be um, present? Why that could be an issue? Well, the reason is because vegetarian diets are historically low in leucine. So leucine is found a ton in meat products, you know, meat, chicken, fish, eggs, things like that. And it's historically low in vegetables, uh, areas that uh, vegetarians will use to try and get protein like tofu, soy, and things like that. So they could have, you know, they would look at studies and say, well, the same amount of protein from these two diets and the vegetarians had less muscle protein synthesis than the carnivores and omnivores, the people that are eating meat. But if you normalize and standardize the amount of leucine that those two groups intake, their muscle protein synthesis rates are the same. So in this scenario, it's not all about protein. For muscle protein synthesis, it's actually very much important that we focus on the specific amino acids, namely leucine. This initiates a pathway in our body called the mTOR pathway. So mTOR and muscle protein synthesis, they're somewhat, they're not synonymous, but they, they go hand in hand with each other when we're talking about our ability to grow muscle and to resynthesize muscle after it's been broken down. So leucine is really, really important. And now we're gonna do some math. So how much protein do we need? So I've, I've taken some numbers from the uh, American College of Sports Medicine, and I've brought them to you. So what you're gonna do is, don't worry, I'm gonna have some examples on the next slide, but if you'd like, you could take out your phone and you could, you could say, this is about what I weigh in pounds. If you take your body weight in, your, in pounds and you divide it by 2.2, you get your body weight in kilograms. So if you know approximately what your weight is in kilograms, 
then you can take this, your body weight in kilograms, and then multiply it by 1.2. So at the low end of the spectrum, we want to take in 1.2 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight every single day. At the high end of the spectrum, we would want to take in two grams of protein per kilogram of body weight every day. And Tanil and Jared, you don't, you don't necessarily need to focus on this because I did it for you. <laughs> so here I have a list of a couple of athletes. The two on the outside are like good athletes, and then the one on the inside is like not a very good athlete. That doesn't work out that much. So I've got Tanil and Jared listed here. So I thought it'd be nice if I gave you guys three examples of people of various body weights and various activity levels. And in, in order to show you what they should be intaking at the low end and high ends of their protein intake spectrum. So Tanil weighs about 118 pounds soaking wet. So we did, <laughs> I did some of the numbers for her. Uh, there are approximate numbers, so you won't see the exact numbers show up here. So 118 divided by 2.2 equals 54 kilograms. So 54 kilograms times 1.2 is 65 grams of protein at the very least every day. And then at the high end, let's say you're doing really intense working out or you're working out every day really intensely, like you do, then you're gonna wanna be more at the high end of the spectrum here. So you're gonna wanna try and shoot for around 90 to 108 grams of protein per day. For me, because I go, I go rock climbing and I, I work out probably four or five days a week. You know, I could probably get away with being more around the middle. So I could probably get, if my low end is 86 and my high end is 144, I'm going to try and at least like, like maybe crack 100 every day. For Jared, you know, since he likes to sit down on a wall without a chair, uh, that's going to really increase his metabolic expenditure during the day. So he's going to be weighing in at about 200 pounds. The low end of his protein intake is the high end of Tennille's. So individual athletes need individual or have individual requirements for protein. So uh, the intake has to be commensurate with the intensity of the exercise as well as your body size overall. How are we doing on time? Oh, I'm doing great. I think I'm crushing it. So Jared's going to want to focus on getting up to 180 grams of protein, especially if you're doing high intensity exercise or you're doing a new type of exercise. So uh, next summer when the Brett Crest Trail Series comes on, you guys are doing a lot more running. It's just going to be really different. So whenever your body experiences a new different stimulus, the muscle breakdown is actually higher. So you actually want to be at the higher end of that range or like after a comp and things like that. So next, we, we talked about how to get the range of values for your protein, the high end and the low end. So the next thing that's really important is our protein distribution. And one of the metaphors and myths that I would love to dispel this evening is the myth that your body is like a car. So if I drove down to Denver tomorrow and then drove back up to Summit County the next day, I would have an empty tank and I could simply go to the gas station and I could refill my tank and then I would be good. However, your body, I hate to break it to you, is not a car because you can't turn off your body and park it in the garage. Your body is a vehicle that is on 24 seven and our intakes have to be commensurate of a vehicle that's running all the time. So you can't, the thing that you hear all the time is, oh, I went to a comp. Oh, I had a big race. Oh, I had a big game. And then I ate a ton of food that night because I was really, really hungry. And I knew that I had expended a bunch of energy. So then I, I refilled that night and I had a cheat day and I ate a bunch of food, right? And then the next day, they go back to eating Cheerios for breakfast, right? So that's not how we're gonna be able to 
maximize protein synthesis. Or what you hear a lot of people say is, I had a big day on the mountain, got home, I ate a bunch of food, and then the next day I, I didn't really do all that much. So I didn't feel like I needed to eat that much or I didn't need to eat that much protein. Which brings us to our next topic, rest day protein. So a day off from the gym is not a day off from muscle protein synthesis. It's, has anybody ever worked out really hard and then been sore or fatigued the next day? Yeah, nobody, right? And <laughs> say, you know, if you haven't been sore the day or two after a workout, then I'm afraid you did not work out. <laughs> so uh, going back to the metaphor that our body's a, a vehicle that's running 24 seven, seven days a week, the next day you're feeling sore, you're feeling fatigued, you're feeling tired. You have to do the right things in order to re-stimulate muscle protein synthesis if you're going to keep adapting to the stimulus that you applied the day before. So rest day protein may be almost more important than the protein that you intake on game day. And that's where a lot of people will drop off. I didn't work out today, input, output, so I don't need to eat that much today. And that's simply not true. We're always recovering and we're always needing to re-stimulate muscle protein synthesis because if we don't do the right things dietarily to do that, then we'll still have protein synthesis for things like I mentioned earlier, the heart, lungs, the, the liver, and things like that. But we can, we can really plateau in our adaptation to exercise because we're not stimulating muscle protein. The three bears and protein distribution. So Goldilocks and the three bears, but you don't want to search Goldilocks on the internet anymore. A bunch of weird stuff comes up. <laughs> so there are a couple of different ways in which people try and get their protein during the day. And some of those would include a spread out protein distribution. So people say, oh, you, you, got, you got to be eating five to seven or eight or 10 meals a day. And you want to get small amounts of protein every single time with that. And I'm going to be talking about some of the reasons why these different types of protein ingestion may or may not be more beneficial. A moderately pulsed protein distribution would be moderate amounts of protein evenly spread throughout your day. So an example here would be three or four meals with between 25 and 35 to 40 grams per day, depending on your size and how much protein you need for that day. And then what the majority of us do, because we don't necessarily think about things and it's, it's more convenient for us, is we'll do a big pulse at the end of the day. And you'll also see this with like people that do intermittent fasting and things like that. So they'll have low protein in the morning and afternoon, maybe like a bowl of cereal or some oats or something like that, maybe some toast or something. So very low amount of protein, five to 10 grams. And then at lunch, they're at work or something like that. So something quick. And they'll get another... 10, maybe 15 grams of protein. And they're like, oh man, I gotta eat more protein for the day. Uh, I'm gonna have a really big dinner. So this big dinner is gonna have all of my protein requirement for the day. So I'm gonna go and I'm gonna hit, you know, 75 to 90 grams of protein. And one of the things that I'd, I'd like to, you know, enlighten you guys on is that the amount of protein synthesis between these three diets is gonna be different across the board. And one of the reasons for this is that there is a meal threshold for protein synthesis. In other words, you have to eat a specific amount of protein and essential amino acids in order to stimulate protein synthesis in muscle. So your brain is a wonderful adaptable organ that creates and, and stimulates all these different functions of our body your brain recognizes that you've gotten in enough protein in order to stimulate muscle growth. Muscle is a very inefficient tissue. It's highly vascularized and it takes up a ton of energy in our body. So our brain has to know that there's enough energy available to create more of this inefficient tissue. So it's, it's kind of like a weird double-edged sword because muscle tissue is inefficient, but like I stated earlier, muscle tissue, the ability to generate power and force and have endurance are also 
huge markers for longevity. So that's why we're trying to maximize the muscle protein synthesis. In the spread distribution, if we're having many meals below 15 to 20 grams of protein, especially if it's not high and rich in those essential amino acids, in that scenario, we're not going to be at the level necessary to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. So if you wake up and you have 10 grams of protein, your body will still synthesize proteins for your heart, lungs, liver, internal organs, etc. But it's not going to be stimulating muscle protein synthesis specifically. You will not initiate the mTOR pathway that's going to bring about muscle protein synthesis. The same thing happens with this big pulse. Now, I'd say that the big pulse is probably a little bit better because in this scenario, at the end of the day, you're getting that large pulse. So you're definitely going to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. However, after we stimulate muscle protein synthesis, we've already done this. You can't overstimulate it. You can't super stimulate it. You can't extra super duper stimulate it, like all the different like brands of things will say, like extra super carnitine and stuff like that. I know if you've walked into a GNC, I know that you've seen super protein, you know? It'll get you even bigger gains than regular, you know? No, not really. So in the big pulse, we are getting muscle protein synthesis, but it's not in a way that continues muscle protein synthesis throughout the day. In the pulsed variation, we are stimulating it early in the morning, which is the next slide, and then also at lunchtime and then at dinner in ways that will maximize muscle protein synthesis. So there was a study looking at the difference between pulsed and then big pulse at the end of the day, protein intake. So the, the, the diets had 30, 30, 30, so 30 grams in the morning, 30 grams in the afternoon, and 30 grams in the evening of protein consumption. Then they compared that to a diet of 10, 10, and then 70. So 10 grams in the morning, 10 in the afternoon, and then 70 grams in the evening. And what they found was that when you do the big pulse in the evening, you're missing out on a quarter of the muscle protein synthesis that's occurring in the pulse to distribution. So MPS was 25% higher when you stimulated the mTOR pathway early in the day with a big pulse of protein. So that's why the next slide is talking about breakfast protein. So after uh, an evening, you know, hopefully we're all getting our requisite seven to 10 hours of sleep per night. I know everybody in here is doing that for sure. And it's a high priority in their life. Yeah, a couple of little like giggles and stuff. So we've been in a fasted state for the past eight to 10 hours. So our amount of muscle protein synthesis, our MPS rate has declined over that fasting period. No, I don't want you to wake up at one in the morning and like go like drink a protein shake. That's not what the, the, what the point of this is, is going to be. But I'm trying to illustrate the fact that getting a, a bolus of protein, an intake of protein is really important first thing in the day. And it's not only important from the standpoint of stimulating your muscles to grow, but Studies have shown that whenever people have a higher protein breakfast, then they have increased satiety throughout the day. And what that is, is an increased sensation of fullness after a meal. So has anybody ever, like me, I used to be a big fruit smoothie guy. I, I'd wake up and then I was a runner, so I had to get my carbs, right? So I would wake up and I'd have like a massive fruit smoothie. So let's say I had that at like 7 or 8 a.m. By 10 a.m. or 10.30, I was starving again. And the reason is because my brain intakes, okay, we took in a lot of energy. So carbohydrates and fats are largely the macronutrients necessary for energy. But my brain was, was sensing, oh, in order to you know, reintegrate and adapt to the training stimulus that you had the day before, 
I need more of this macronutrient. And that's why for some people, having a really high carb diet can actually be kind of tricky, especially if they're trying to lose weight. Because what they found in studies is that high carb individuals, their brain is telling them, we need to eat more and we need to eat more frequently in order to get the amount of structural proteins that we need to stimulate things like muscle protein synthesis and reintegrate these structural components of our bodies and not just get more energy in. So breakfast protein is really important, a really important thing to focus on. Actually, if you listen to one of the researchers of the previous study that I mentioned, comparing the 10, 10, 70 and the 30, 30, 30, he said if he could go back and redo that study again, instead he would do a larger pulse at breakfast and then actually a smaller pulse at lunch. Because once you stimulate that pathway for muscle protein synthesis, it's turned on for over five hours. So if it's stimulated, you know, if you, even if you're infusing essential amino acids, you can't keep stimulating it more. There's a refractory period. There's a period in which we cannot still keep stimulating muscles to grow. So that's why having a defined distribution would actually be better than getting it continuously throughout your day. Because you'll get the same amount of protein synthesis no matter what, uh, if you're getting it all you know, at the end of the day or whatever. But what we really want to focus on are these large boluses or large intakes intermittently throughout the day. And that's how we gonna, we're going to maximize protein synthesis. I probably mixed my words a little bit there with that last uh, metaphor. But. So now I'm talking about protein supplements. So this is Al Pacino in Scarface. Sorry, it came out a little bit blurry. He was a really big fan of vanilla protein powder. Uh, I think he was actually a vanilla protein powder distributor for a little bit of time uh, during the movie. It was probably his favorite flavor. Although his ingestion through the nose, I don't think is like a, a very beneficial methodology. And one of the, the biggest protein uh, supplements that you'll see is branch chain amino acids. How are we doing on time? Oh, I'm doing, I'm crushing it, okay. So the, the branch chain amino acids, I wanna remove the illusion and, and remove this mystery around why we need branch chain amino acids, we've got to supplement them. Because if you walk into a supplement store and you, and you just ask one of their representatives, hey bro, load me up. They're gonna say, all right, I got you. So I got you your pre-workout, I got you your protein supplement, I got you your meal uh, excess supplement, and then I got you your BCAAs, okay? But what are BCAAs? BCAAs are branch chain amino acids. So they're just amino acids, the things that we were talking about earlier. The amino acids in question are leucine, isoleucine, and valine. So we know the importance of leucine. Isoleucine and valine are also very much important. Now, don't get me wrong, these branch chain amino acids are really important. They're predominantly structural. So they're the things that help us recreate the, the myofilaments for the contractile properties in our muscle tissue. So the, the myosin, fibrinogen, keratin is found within our hair and our nails. Hemoglobin is the protein that carries oxygen throughout our blood. So has anybody ever heard of like iron deficiency anemia? So you have low iron in that scenario, but What's the thing carrying the iron which carries the oxygen? Hemoglobin, which is a protein that comes from branch chain amino acids. But this shouldn't be some mystical substance that we have to supplement because branch chain amino acids account for over 20% of the amino acids that we get in dietary sources that are rich in protein. So especially like meat proteins, so if we're talking about meat, eggs, fish, chicken, things like that, over 20% of the protein there is gonna be amino acids. So 25 grams of protein will likely contain around two grams of leucine alone. And remember, that's that important stimulating molecule that actually signals that, oh, it's okay to have muscle protein synthesis now. 
the thing that our, bro- our body recognizes and says, okay, let's make some more muscle. So there's my rant on branched chain amino acids. So the, the big takeaway is that if you're taking in enough protein overall throughout your day, and it's from good sources that are rich in essential amino acids, then you may not need to take in extra amounts of branched chain amino acids because you're likely getting the requisite amount to do all the things that we want to do. So that's one of the ways in which this lecture is going to save you a lot of money because people will tell you, oh yeah, if you want to maximize your muscle growth, then you have to take branched chain amino acids. But that's actually not true. The amount of protein synthesis, if you're getting in like a whey protein, uh, a whey protein supplement, or if you're just getting all of this in your diet, which is the most beneficial way, you're gonna be getting those essential amino acids in anyways. So whey protein is a dairy-derived um, protein supplement. It is really high in leucine. So there are 3.5 grams of leucine in 25 grams of whey. So I guarantee you there are people that are just throwing money down the drain by buying a whey protein supplement and also purchasing branched chain amino acids and then supplementing those on top. Like I said earlier, once you've stimulated the mTOR pathway, once you've stimulated muscle protein synthesis, there's no overstimulation. Pouring more and more and more on top of the, this issue is not gonna make it better. So once you open the door for MPS, you could do that with a whey protein supplement, or the best way to do it is through food alone, then there's no sense in supplementing uh, on top of that. It would be much better to just focus on things like sleep, water, micronutrients, vitamins, minerals, fruits, vegetables, et cetera. Uh, some people talk about how it's fast acting and it gets into your muscles really quickly. I wouldn't really focus on that. The thing to really focus on is continuously stimulating MPS throughout your day in a good distribution. That's the most important thing. It's not that these proteins are going to get into your muscles faster and help them build stronger and faster. Uh, the, the rates of that muscle protein aren't going to be changed depending on the supplemental choice that you do. Since I'm doing so good on time, I'm going to talk about collagen. Okay. So collagen is something that I take personally. Collagen is uh, derived from boiling down the tendons, ligaments, and connective tissues that we don't eat in meat. So this has a high density of these amino acids, like glycine, proline, hydroxy, proline, and hydroxy leucine. Oh, lysine. Oh, that, that, that last one always gets me, but it's the only time I wasn't looking at the projector, of course. Glycine is every third amino acid whenever we're creating non-contractile connective tissue. So whenever we're creating our tendons and ligaments and fascia, glycine is the third link in that chain. So what they found is that for when individuals have non-contractile injuries, so injuries to tendons, injuries to ligaments, sometimes even uh, injuries to bones. They've done some studies on uh, like osteoporosis and uh, osteopenia, um, uh, like people that are suffering from that. Uh, and what we really don't think about all the time with collagen is that collagen is an, an integral constituent of bone itself. So part of our bone is obviously a, a calcium matrix, a calcium crystal, and that's what provides a lot of the rigidity of bone. But bone itself is also very highly composed of collagen. The proportion of our bone, that's collagen, is the highest when we're this tall. So when we're really young. And this manifests itself in the types of fractures that you've seen little kids get. So they'll get these things called green stick fractures and torus fractures. So it's like their bones are made out of rubber. So they'll, they'll break, but they don't really break. It's almost like you take a, a sapling and then you bend it. It doesn't snap like a dead tree branch. It just bends and then part of it on the outside might break a little bit. The reasoning behind that 
is because they have a high proportion of collagen in their bone matrix. So actually supplementing with collagen has been shown to benefit people that are recovering from or have had injuries to tissues such as the tendons and ligaments and maybe the cartilage and their bone tissue. So this is something that I take because I'm a rock climber and I put too much stress on non-contractile tissues in my fingers. So if you're one of the people recovering from some injury to their tendons and ligaments, usually in my clinical practice, I'll, I'll recommend, hey, maybe take a little bit of collagen and that will saturate your blood with these essential amino acids. Actually, some of these are non-essential, but it will saturate your blood with these amino acids and potentially get those into the areas that are needing, needing to turn over with our rehabilitation. But what are the best sources of protein? The best sources of protein are the, the foods that we can naturally get these proteins from. So you guys maybe heard some of the ranges that I was talking about earlier and you're like, whoa, dude, that's a lot of protein. I don't know if I can take in like that much protein. But if we're pretty conscious about some of the sources and the amounts that we're getting and we just distribute these sources throughout our day, it's really not that hard. So you see here, four ounces of steak has 24 grams of protein. So if you go to Whole Foods and you get a New York strip steak, about how much does that usually weigh? It's usually about 14 to 16 ounces. So if we take a fourth of that New York strip steak, we get 24 grams of protein. Steak, eggs, chicken, things like that, they're rich in essential amino acids and rich in leucine. So if we get, you know, it, a lot of people say like, it's about the size of your fist, about the size of your fist in steak, or like what Brian asked me earlier today, how, what did you eat for breakfast? I was kind of like short on time, so I just had three eggs. So one egg has eight grams of protein. So if I remember my times tables correctly, that's about 24 grams of protein that's rich in essential amino acids. So that's enough. You know, it's probably not enough for me to kind of rest on my laurels throughout the day because I didn't get a really, really large bolus of protein, but it's it's at least enough to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. Um, the one that always gets me is like one medium-sized chicken breast. It's like 37 grams of protein. So that's something that a lot of people do. And they're going home at the end of the day and they're like, all right, cool, I'm going to eat five chicken breasts and some broccoli, you know? And it's like, you don't need to do that. You can just distribute it throughout your day and you're gonna probably be better off than when you go home and like overeat at the end of the day. Because, kind of the theme here, we wanna distribute that in even amounts and in order to stimulate muscle protein synthesis throughout the day, as opposed to just at night when we get home. Because when we're not using these proteins for muscle protein synthesis, we'll store them in our liver or we'll deaminate them, we'll take the nitrogens off of them. And then what happens to a lot of people is like, let's say they work out and they're like, I'm trying to get really, really swole really, really fast. So I worked out, I drank a protein shake that had 25 grams of protein. And then I had a protein bar that had another 15 grams of protein. And then I went home and I ate four steaks. And that's how you get what, are, what we can refer to as the protein farts because your body's removing a lot of the nitrogen, it's removing a lot of the sulfur from those amino acids, and then it's excreting them in sometimes favorable ways and sometimes unfavorable ways like that. One apple has 0.5 grams of protein. So an apple a day may keep the doctor away, but it won't really be the best source as far as getting your macronutrient intake for protein. Now, if you leave this lecture saying, oh, Nick said I should eat meat all day and then not eat apples, then I've failed you once again. So uh, I may be focusing, like me personally, I may be focusing on getting some of these in throughout my day and maybe even looking at other sources such as eating uh, like beans and like yogurts and stuff like that. But when I'm not eating these things, you know that I'm just shoving as many apples and vegetables and good things into myself as I can. 
uh, because those are also very, very important for our longevity and getting in the requisite vitamins and nutrients and minerals that we need for normal physiological functioning. Now, one cup of pinto beans has 12 grams of protein in it. And the thing that we need to recognize about things like pinto beans, and if you're going to try and do, uh, you're trying to work at a, a very high level or have a high level of fitness and work out on a vegetarian diet, is that it's, you have to have a little bit more food savvy whenever you're focusing on vegetable sources of protein. So if you look at the ability for our body to take in this protein relative to this protein, it's much more difficult for us to derive those amino acids from something like beans and starches and things like that. The way that we measure protein is we measure nitrogen because nitrogen is something that's not found in carbohydrates and fats. But the thing is that many of the nitrogen-containing compounds and many of the proteins that are in plants are in the structural components that create those uh, beans and lentils and rice, et cetera. So the structural proteins for animals are very similar to the structural proteins for us. The structural proteins, proteins for plants are different. They may be connected to insoluble fibers that we can't necessarily use. So when we take in 12 grams of protein from like beans or an apple or something like that, we may not actually get that 12 grams of protein. We may be getting eight to 10. So if you are a vegetarian or you're trying to focus on vegetarian sources for your protein, then aim for the high end of your spectrum as far as your protein intake and you should actually be totally fine. And your muscle protein synthesis rates will be similar to if you were getting all of those from meat. I'm not telling everybody to just go and eat like all meat every day. So throw in all of these sources as well. But when you're utilizing these sources, then it would be beneficial for you to try and get a lot more of those sources in or aim for the high end of your protein consumption. And I got these. And one of the ways that I will sometimes track my macronutrients and stuff is a website called chronometer.com. It's a free resource that's really, really beneficial. I'm not like paid or sponsored by chronometer. I just use it. Um, and it's a, it's a pretty nice uh, source of information as far as if you're questioning how much protein you've gotten in the day. So last so slide, the protein take home points. We want to get 1.2 to 2.0 grams per kilogram of body weight in protein per day. We want to have three to four large intakes starting at around 25 grams. Days off of the gym are not days off of protein consumption. So if you're working out six days a week on that seventh day, you still need to focus on getting in your requisite amounts of protein in a good distribution if you're going to maximize your recovery and your muscle performance for the next week. Try to source from food whenever possible and then supplement when necessary. So, you know, recommendations would probably be for like a, a whey protein supplement if you weren't getting in the necessary amount. So like me yesterday, I went to like a conference and we got some like really small lunch there. And then I came here last night for Tanil's birthday where I ate a bunch of cake. So I had, I, I like drank away protein supplement afterwards. Cause I was like, yeah, I ate a bunch of candy and stuff, but I didn't get the amount of protein. Back. And that's it. Thanks you guys so much for coming. This program is for informational purposes only and is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Always consult with your physician before starting any exercises or doing anything contained in this program. Always stop if you experience any pain, discomfort, or difficulties performing anything described in this program.